appreciate those songs. I don't know about you, but I serve a good, good, good father. I know when I do my devotions, I'm one of those people that uh, in the morning when I do my devotions and when I pray, I do it as I walk. I uh, try to walk to get this body moving. And one of the things always, I just thank God for how good he has been to me. I'm just amazed. I look at my life. I'm sure as you look at your life, the mercy and goodness and grace of God that he has shown on us. And we praise him for that. This morning you have me. Pastor Matt is down. and I'm assuming it's in uh, sunshine and a little warmer than it is here. It only took me about three or four days to get used to spring weather, all right? I am now in shock, all right? In fact, I'm a little depressed. I, I expect it to be 80 degrees, but it's not going to be 80 degrees. So, hey, and the body is letting me know that. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, a lot of the verses we'll put on the screen uh, I was in the Sunday school class this morning. We have a men's uh, group, and we were discussing a little bit, really, the direction of our nation today and how it's becoming so really separated from what I would call biblical morality and the principles, all right, of the Word of God. And I think the message that God laid on my heart this morning applies to all of us as we live in the midst of the society, we find ourselves, yet we are called by God to be salt and light in that society to hold up his banner of truth. Now, as we'll be looking at some verses in 1 Kings 17, 18, one need to understand, uh, really, the nation of Israel, a little bit like where we're at today. The nation of Israel was in a moral free fall. Many of the people have turned their backs uh, on God especially the king, King Ahab, and his wife. You might uh, remember a woman by the name of Jezebel. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 16, it says a little bit about them, what they had done. It says, Now Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than everyone that was before him. That's quite a statement, right? Uh, that you are so evil, all right, that, uh, again, how you are living your life supersedes everybody who came before you. And it came to pass, although it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethanbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a woman image. And then notice this statement. It says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. There's one thing I do not want to do, and that is to provoke God to anger, all right? But Ahab did. He shattered the record. Shattered the record for rebellion. Not only turned away from God, literally, if you understand the story, he was anti-God, all right? He was devoted to idolatry. He made molten uh, images to pagan gods set up idolatrous altars all over the land. And the whole culture, all right, as a leader of Israel, became depraved. Uh, the culture became one that was in rebellion against God. Now, when a culture becomes in rebellion against God, it does something. It does something to the nation socially. Uh, family life in Israel was decaying. Lust, violence, all right, were everywhere. Also, there was a lot of confusion mentally in Israel. Their thoughts were continually towards evil, that which was ungodly, and they were confused of what was right, what was wrong. It was literally a society, anything went. You did what you thought was right in your own heart. Now, because of that, it was a culture that it was not very comfortable or convenient to take a stand for who? To take a stand for God, all right? In other words, the tendency and the temptation was, be quiet, all right? Be that secret agent believer, all right? In other words, you can believe, just don't stand out in the society. Now, I believe that's the world in many ways we find ourselves today. 
a world of social decay. If you look on what's going on, uh, people are confused mentally. What is right? What is wrong? All right, what am I to say? What am I to do? Spiritual rebellion, think in many ways to God. But yet it's a society that if you talk to people, that people are, are trying to find peace, they're trying to find hope, trying to find meaning in their life, but apart from Jesus Christ. Now, I believe biblically, and I stand on the Word of God, you'll never find meaning, you'll never find peace, all right, for your life outside of Jesus Christ. Now, our enemy is going to tell us, all right, in the midst of this kind of culture, you really can't live for God and make a difference. So what you do, whether you're in school, whether you're in your workplace, business, whatever, you just hunker down and ride it out, all right? God's in control. One day he's returning. He'll establish his kingdom of right uh, here and now. You just, just, you know, be quiet. All right? Just don't do anything to attract attention. But praise God, they're wrong. See, I believe this. You and I can make an impact for God in this world. Now, there might be many things, all right, that are going on around us, all right, that are unbiblical. But, you know, there's a special responsibility, privilege, blessing that God has placed us in this world at this time that we can be salt and light in a world that is looking for meaning. We can take a stand that makes a difference, not only in my life, but in society I find myself. So what I want to do, I'm going to look at somebody you're familiar with that lived in the days of Ahab and Jezebel who took... Uh, Maria stand for God, took his ground for God, and a man who refused to be intimidated, all right, willing to forget about comfort, willing to forget about convenience in order to be a witness for God. And that man was the prophet by the name of Elijah. Now, we are first introduced to Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Listen how he comes on the scene, and I'm going to start reading verse 1. It says that Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, all right, is the prophet, unknown man, comes to the king of the nation. And he says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, before whom I serve, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. See, there was a promise made in the book of Deuteronomy that God gave to Moses, that he gave to the people of Israel, that if you turn from me, I'll withhold the rain from heaven, the dew from coming up on the earth, that your crops will fail. And here you find the prophet Elijah pronouncing that curse. Then the word of the Lord came to him, or came to Elijah, saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows from the Jordan. And it will be that you will drink from that brook that I have commanded, and that the ravens will feed you there. So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Let me read a couple other verses. I'm skipping over to chapter 18, verse 17. He uh, remains hidden until God tells him now is the time to go to Ahab again. Then in verse 17, it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you that troubles Israel? Literally, the king is saying to Elijah, Everybody else goes along. Everybody else is on the same agenda. Everybody else is speaking the same thing. And you are taking the stand that you say is for the Lord God of Israel, and you're troubling everybody. You're creating problems. But it says in verse 18, Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's 850 of them. It says, bring them all. Bring them all to the mountains. So Ahab sent for the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together 
on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came out, all right, before all the people that were there, before those 850 prophets, and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? How long are we going to be back and forth, back and forth, what is true, what is right? He says, If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them choose and give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you will call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now, How does a person, you think about what's going on. This is not some story, all right, of make-believe. This was a man, all right, like you and I standing on one of the great mountains of Israel with all the people of the nation around him, 850 prophets against him, the king that is there. And he says, literally, we're going to decide who was God this day. And we are going to set up two altars on which to sacrifice. Except we're not going to do it the usual way. The usual way, they would cut that sacrifice and they would light the fire on the wood and the sacrifice will be consumed. He said, this time, we're going to let God light the fire himself. And if Baal is God, and he lights that wood and consumes that sacrifice, then the nation will follow him. But if the Lord God of Israel hears my prayer and lights that fire and consumes it, then he is the God, and this nation will serve him. Now, I mean, look, one guy, right? How in the world... Does he summon the courage and faith to hold fast, all right, to his God when everybody else is just vacillating back or forth or else has forsaken the Lord God? I'm going to give you three principles this morning, all right, that I see in the life of Elijah. It needs to be in my life and your life if we are to make a difference. See, we are here at this time not to blend in to society We're here as salt and light to make a difference in the world in which we are in, all right? How do you do that? Some things I think we can see in Elijah's life. Number one, and there's an outline, should be right there in your bulletin. Elijah was convinced of the reality of God. Elijah was convinced of the reality of God. Notice the first words that you hear from Elijah's mouth. From the first time he is introduced to us, he says, as the Lord God of Israel, what? Lives. God is alive, and Elijah recognized that fact. You know, Ahab and Jezebel thought that they had successfully put an end to Jehovah, but he made one serious miscalculation, and that was a man by the name of Ahab who was convinced with all of his heart and all of his being that the Lord God of Israel existed. Let me ask you a question. And don't be too quick to answer yes, because you're going to want to answer yes right away. How convinced are you this morning of the reality of Almighty God? Now, our, our answer, you know, almost responsibly would be yes. I am convinced of the reality of God. But I would say this, if you and I are convinced of the reality of God, then it would directly affect our prayer life, that we would be people of prayer, that we would find it hard to start a day or go through a day without prayer and communing to that God that we say is real in our life. It would affect my service. If I was convinced of the reality of God, I wouldn't need anybody to convince me to serve him, all right? I would serve him willingly. It would affect my attitude. If I was convinced of the reality of God, no matter what temporary circumstances came into my life, 
I would not be thrown into the depths of despair and fear. For my God lives. And not only does he live, but he reigns over his creation. Also, it would affect my hopes, wouldn't it? It would affect my expectations. And that's how I see it with Elijah. He believed in God. He went by the brook Cherith. Think about it. God ended up telling him, I want you to go right to the king. I want you to tell him right in his face, it is not going to rain on this nation until I declare by the word of God that it rains. And then God tells him to go by a brook, and he's going to hide himself until God again tells him to reveal himself. And you know, very interesting, all right? He's going to go to a brook. He's going to hide himself there. How is God going to take care of him? God is going to give him water by the brook, but how is he going to feed him? Do you ever you didn't notice? Ra- I don't know if you know about ravens, all right? Ravens are not the bird that you want to trust feeding you. Uh, they're known to kill their own young. They're known to take care of their needs first. So I'm going to give you your food by a creature, all right, who was known not to be, you know, a... That, that help person that you're going to need. But he's telling uh, Elijah, you just trust me. I'm going to provide for you. You don't need to know how I'm going to provide. I'm going to tell you in this case, but I will provide for you. And you just trust me. And what does he do? He goes right to the brook and does exactly what God says. On Mount Carmel, all right, we read the verses in chapter uh, 18. As he stands to proclaim, all right, the Lord God. And you can read these verses. Not the, the prophets of Baal fail, all right, in calling down fire. But you read in chapter 18 when you find Elijah going there. He ends up uh, telling the men, all right, we're going to make this a little hard for the Lord God of Israel. All right, we're going to fill four water pots full of water, and I want you to pour them on the sacrifice. All right, I've camped enough to know this. Wet wood does not light, all right? And, uh, and, but not only pour it on once, pour it on twice, pour it on three times, all right? And then praise down fire from heaven. You know, I was thinking about this. Here's a man who was convinced with all of his heart in the reality of God that nothing was too hard for him. Now, I'm asking, and I have to ask myself and ask us, what is there... That is positive proof of the reality of God in your life. I mean, you see it in in Elijah's life, right? What is there if somebody came and said, all right, can you tell me, if you went to your wife, went to your kids, went to your close friend, what do you see in my life that is positive proof? And I'm not talking about going to church, all right? That is positive proof of the reality of God in their life, all right? question is, what is there in your life or my life that demonstrates to a world screaming for the reality if there is a God that demonstrates that there is truly the Lord God? Do those closest to you recognize the reality of God in your life? See, this world today, all right, I, I was raised in a culture, you know, it's a lot of years ago, when people had respect of a person was in, quote, ministry, all right, worked in a church. Today, this world doesn't necessarily respect if a person is a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a children's worker, youth you know, director or a servant at church. It's impressed only to the extent that Jesus Christ is really a reality in your life, that it changes your life, and I can see something different uh, in your life. And I'm saying that we need to be the people that convince this world that God is alive. It's like... I came across, I I have a file of illustrations, all right, talking about letting people see the reality, all right, of a God in our life. Years ago, during the Second World War, all right, when the guys were going uh, overseas, they would have GI insurance, and I'm assuming they they still have it today. Well, in this story, there was a second lieutenant just graduated from Harvard, and uh, one of his first assignments was he was going to have to end up sell, uh, all right, the guys that were... Uh, getting ready to be shipped overseas, uh, GI insurance. And that was going to be his first assignment. He was going to tell them, well, you know, 
you need to get this insurance because it'll pay ten thousand dollars if you die uh, overseas it'll pay uh, your loved ones any oh, man gave this great speech you know elegant speech appealed to these men's responsibility to their family love and loyal to the country and he came to the end you know and asked how many of you are willing to buy GI insurance and you know how many raised their hand none all right the guy was a little depressed and so he ended up uh, shared again all right and again no response and, uh, you know, at this point, he, he lost it, all right, and uh, couldn't really afford to do it, couldn't convince any of them. And finally, an uh, old sergeant comes up. He says, let me take care of this. Let, let, I think I can get to these guys. So he ends up turns to the man. He says, gentlemen, it's like this. You go overseas, and you don't buy GI insurance, and you get a bullet. The government doesn't have to come up with anything. On the other hand, if you go overseas and you buy GI insurance, get a bullet, the government has to come up with 10,000 big ones. Let's go over it again. You go overseas, you don't buy GI insurance, you get a bullet. The government doesn't have to come up with anything. On the other hand, you go overseas, you have GI insurance, you get a bullet. Government has to come up with 10,000 big ones. Now tell me, gentlemen. Who do you think the government is going to send first to the front lines? Ooh. All of a sudden, babe, everybody raises their hands. See? What I'm saying? You can't sell anything to somebody unless they see they need it. Now, I'm not selling, saying we sell Jesus. But you're not going to be used of God to convince someone that they need him unless they can see that need through your life and my life, all right? I'm saying what is there in your life or my life that show the reality of God? Uh, I put on your outline what's involved for that to happen. Number one, devotion. You need to have a devotion to God. What do I mean by that? You have to have a daily time with God. You're not going to be convinced of the reality of God in your life unless you spend time with him. When you read the life of Elijah, two things stand out, words you find over and over again. He would hide himself, he would reveal himself. Hide himself, reveal himself. Hide himself, reveal himself. You need to take time, I need to take time in the Word of God, in communion with God, that I have a personal, intimate relationship with him. And then, when God chooses, he takes and reveals and we are able, all right, to be witnesses for him. And I ask you this, how is your devotion time, your quiet time with him? Also, it involves separation. In verse 17, I read the verses, King Ahab ended up saying, all right, to Elijah, you're the one that's troubling all Israel, all right? See, literally what he's telling Elijah, you're out of step with everybody else. Everybody's going this direction Elijah, you're going that direction, all right? You're troubling the whole nation. Let me say this. If you're in step with God, you're going to be out of step with this world. If you find yourself living in this world and you're ended up saying, well, I just don't, I think everything is great. Everything is, I don't have any problems. I'm not out of step with anyone. Something is wrong. See, as a believer, there we're going to have to say no to some things, all right? But there's really only one thing you do give up, and that is sin. But I'm saying it involves separation. You've got to take a stand, all right, for what the Word of God says. And it involves proclamation. That means you need to get excited about your message. God's going to give you opportunity to say something. And when God gives you an opportunity, you end up saying it. Now, of course, you, you'll be intimidated. I, I remember even as a young Christian... And uh, I heard uh, to share my faith. But when the Holy Spirit would, you know, prompt my heart, most of the times I had a fear and say, well, what happens if they reject it? What happens if they, you know, they say this or they make fun of me or what? It doesn't matter. I got to stand up for him. And I'm saying Elijah was a man. He was absolutely convinced that there was a God. How convinced are you in the reality of God and do people see in your life? Let me give you the second one. He was convinced that he was a representative of God. Because he not only said in chapter 70, verse 1, 
as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. He says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, I know he lives, but I stand before him, I serve him. I don't serve myself. I don't serve you. I serve the Lord God. See, Elisha saw himself as a servant of God, standing in his presence, all right, ready at a moment's notice to do what his will was. You look at his words on Mount Carmel. In verse 36, chapter 18, he prays, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that, what does he say? I am your servant and all that I have done, all right, these things at your word. He was a personal representative of the Lord God. You know, too many people th today throw up their hands thinking things are hopeless. Let, yet, you know, in the days of Elijah, he didn't throw up his hands, but he recognized that he was a personal representative of God. I got to ask this. Do you and I see ourselves as personal representatives of God? All right? And I don't mean just when somebody stands behind a pulpit or goes to a mission field, does mission trips. I'm talking about if you're in school, you're a personal representative of God. All right? If you're in a neighborhood, you're a personal representative of God. If you're at your workplace, you're a personal representative of God. This is how Elijah saw life. He was not here to do his agenda. He was not here to live his life to make a name or a fortune that people would know him. He was a representative of God that the people would know him, the Lord God of Israel. Do you see yourself as a representative of God? Let me give you three quick, and I think I put on the outline, really reasons that, could, that should compel us, that we live our lives as his representatives and not really for all this world has to offer. Number one, everything in this world is temporal. You're going to leave everything behind. I don't care how big of a house you have, big a car you have, what money you have. You're leaving it all behind. You understand? It's like the old saying, there's no U-holes behind the hearses. All right? I mean, you literally, it's not like the ancient Egyptians. They piled all their wealth, you know, into their graves. I mean, you could pile everything you have, all right? into the hole they're going to put in your casket. You're not taking it with you, all right? It is temporal. I'm not saying it's wrong to enjoy things. Whatever God has given you is from his hand. You enjoy them. But it's temporal. It's not eternal. That's why 2 Peter 3.10, Peter says this, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat both the earth and the world, all right, that are in it will be burned up. It's all going to be gone, all right? That car, that house, that furniture, it's all going to be gone. So I can't build my life on something that's just going to pass away. It needs to be something eternal. Also, life is too short to be wasted. James said this in verse 14 of chapter 4, What is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Young people, you don't understand how fast life goes. Man, it's like yesterday, I'm remembering dying and I getting married, me getting on the bus, leaving Philadelphia, going to really Decatur, Illinois, all right, as an 18-year-old, all right, to get married. I'm looking back, what's happened 53 years later, all right? Seven, just, it... It's like, it, your life is like a vapor. It's so short. Whatever you're going to do, you better do it quickly. And I'm saying the best way to invest your life is as a representative of the Lord God. And then your service to God is never in vain. It's worthwhile. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing your labor is not in vain. In my 72 years, I've, I've poured my, I'm one of these guys that, whatever you're going to do, you do with all your might. But some of my pursuits did not yield fruit, all right? A lot of sweat, a lot of energy, 
a lot of money and no results. <laughs> right? All right. That's never in God's work. Whatever you do in his name is not in vain. Eternal rewards. And I'm saying Elijah was convinced, hey, I'm here as a representative of the Lord God. I mean, what greater position could I have? Think about this. I, you know, and I, I wonder sometimes, why in the world would God choose us to be his children? Sometimes I'm just, I, if you knew me like God knows, you wouldn't have anything to do with me. But if I knew you the way God knows you, I probably, it wouldn't bother me, all right? But the thing of it is God knows us and wants us as is, he chose to adopt us. And not only adopt us, he's, I tell you what, I want you to be my PR man. I want you to be my representative. I want you to stand before the world and show who I am and what I can do. Man, if anything, you get us excited, right? I'm representing God. I'm not representing no corporation. I'm not representing some company. I'm, present, I'm representing the creator of all life and of all things. Well, let me give you one last thing, that third point. Elijah was convinced that he had the resources of God. He, he had to be convinced that. He goes to, you know, Ahab and says, it's not going to rain no more. All right? Now, understand, he understands the prophecy of God. He understands what? Really, God said in the book of Deuteronomy. In chapter 18, he issues the challenge, all right? He says, if the Lord God be God, let him be the one that's going to light this sacrifice. And if you look at verse 38 of chapter 18, it says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that is in the trench. Now, you just got to picture this, right? you got these 850, all right, pagan, all right, priests. And they're watching what's going on. you got this crazy guy by the name of Elijah. He has 12, really, basically barrels of water poured on this sacrifice. The wood's drenched. Sacrifice drenched. The, the, the really, moat around, all right, the altar is full of water. And this guy is praying. Now, you just think what their eyes look like. When the fire came down from heaven, and not only burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stone, like the, your stones, right? Licked up the dust and consumed the water. I'd say the blood went out of their face, <laughs> right? I mean, you to, how he was convinced. It's, God's a, it's not I'm able to do God's able to do it. Hey, this is no big thing for him. He created the, the wood. He created the, the ox. I mean, he created the water. I'm convinced that I have the resource. He, not, he wasn't some kind of magician. All right? It wasn't a magic trick. In fact, James says he was a man just like us. He says that in 517. But he said he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. He was able to trust God for what he promised. Today we live in a world, again, that largely has turned away from the one true God. In the midst of this world, sometimes we throw up our hands and say, what can I do? That's literally what we say. What can little old me do? Right? I'm a nobody in the midst of all these people. But, you know, I thought about this. You have, and I have everything Elijah had. What did he have? He had the promises of God, right? God's word. He had the spirit of God. And he had the power of prayer. Wait a minute, don't I have? Do, are the promises of God as real for us as they were for Elijah? Or are they out of date or something? They're only for special people? No. How about prayer? Am I able to pray today? The spirit of fact, back then, the spirit of God did not dwell within, but came upon. And today, the spirit of God lives within us. Can we really believe today God for what he promises in Scripture and literally pray? In fact, uh, I'll, I'll share this with you. I was sharing it with the men. I'm getting ready to go on the mission trip. Now, I still have to remind myself of this, all right? 
And, uh, and when you go on these mission trips, you're trying to raise money. And I have people that go with me. They, they got to take up two weeks of work. They got to raise over $2,000. And there's other expenses. And then I have to raise that for myself. Plus, all right, I need to raise ten dollars to $15,000 to get equipment to go on those trips. And um, God has a way of always, wherever he calls you, he never gives you everything on the front end, all right? Because then you wouldn't have to have any faith, all right? It's like you just step by step. But, you know, as time gets closer, like I'm about like six, seven weeks out, Bill's the type of person, I'd like to have it all done two, two months in advance. I, I, it's all taken care of. You know, it's all planned out. But God doesn't do it that way. So finances were, I, I'm looking, I need to do this, this, and this, but I don't have the money. And I'm going, well, i got to send out another letter. You read them, i send another letter. And then it end up, you know, I remember remembering men from two centuries ago, you read about, like Muir and orphanages, that, that he would never even ask anybody for money but pray to God. I said, Lord God, you still do that. And the day I was thinking about that, I come home and go in the mailbox, and there was a $7,000 check. And it's like the God just literally speak, Bill, I have this. I have the resources. <laughs> you just trust me and do, all right, what I call you to do. All right? We all battle with this. Don't tell me we don't. Right? Are you convinced you have the resources of Almighty God to do what he calls you to do? Ask yourself. This, we, we live in a, an, a tough time but exciting time. There probably could be no more exciting time, all right? To serve God. We need to ask, is the Lord a living reality in my life? Do people notice? Do people, whoa, there is something different <laughs> about you. I can't explain it outside of God. Do you see yourself as a representative? When, when you get up in the morning dressed to go to work, do you see yourself as a representative of God? All right? Uh, one to be used of God as he sees fit? And do you live with the conviction that the resources of God are available to you? If so, man, we take that stand like Elijah and we change the world. We can change, well, I'm going to say, this, I'm going to correct myself. He changes the world, right? And I just challenge, you know, don't, I, don't I look at the news and I get discouraged anymore, all right? We don't need to be discouraged. We need to proclaim there is a God. We sung about it. We ended up saying that, you know, I stand in his love, right? We need, the world needs to see there is a God. He's real in my life. He can be real in your life. And that we, by faith, take a stand for him. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I don't know what your situation is, whether at a workplace, whether at home whatever it is in life, but I, I know this, we're all tempted to be that secret believer. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't believe, but yet we're afraid to take that outward stand. We're afraid to let it be known that we're a follower of the Lord God, especially in certain circles. We need to be a little bit like Elijah, or a lot more like Elijah. Even in the midst of a hostile world, we share that there is a God. See, our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to a hostile world. And he shared the message that their creator, the God of all, loves them. So loved them, he gave his son. And Jesus stood and proclaimed that message. Many rejected it, but many received. And we here this morning, I trust that you have received that message. And we need to take that same message and share it with others around us. We start in our homes that our children would see the reality of God in our lives. They would see us as we take a stand as a representative of God. And they would see that we believe that wherever God leads us, God's grace and provision will follow. 